But this afternoon, I want to speak to you on living Bibles. Tell somebody, living Bibles. You'll be wondering, where is Bishop going from here? You see, it's very, very important that you grow in your spiritual walk with God. You need to grow in your spiritual walk with God. It should not be enough to just come to church. This thing is about a personal relationship with God. And when I say living Bibles, there is one particular translation of the Bible called the living Bible. That means that the word of God is alive, is living. You can feel it. It's not a dead thing. And every one of us must become living, walking Bibles. Amen. I want you to turn your Bibles with me to James chapter 1 verse 22. As I was ending the morning service, the Lord showed me to pray for people who are struggling to read their Bibles. And you see, the moment we begin to struggle to read our Bibles, it is the beginning of backsliding. Satan has been around for a very long time. He's been a master at it. He knows how to divert your attention, distract you from reading the Bible. Whenever you feel like reading the Bible, I want you to know that no one on their own accord just have a feeling for reading the Bible. It's a spiritual thing. And the beginning point of backsliding starts with the neglect of reading the Bible. And the second stage is the neglect of prayer. Indeed, once your Bible reading life goes down, your prayer life will go down. They are linked. Your prayer life will go down. Now, the Bible says in James chapter 1 verse 22. It says, be doers of the word. And not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You see, because God has exalted his word above him, Psalm 138, he has exalted his word even above his name. The word of God is supreme. And if you want to engage God, if you want to receive revelations from God, if you want to walk with God, you want to understand God, you must understand his word. So you must have an appetite, first of all, from reading the word because these are levels. If you haven't even started studying the word, you are already failing. But we can't study the word until we have started reading the word. And we must have an attitude of reading the word. And so it's an intentional thing. The Bible says that you must be a doer of the word. That is one that actually practices the word. And not hearers only. Otherwise you are deceiving yourself. So it's not enough to come to church. It's not enough to hear about the Bible and the word of God. But we must be practical practitioners of the word of God. A Christian is a practitioner of Christ. And Christ is the word. In the beginning, John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And all things were created by him and for him and without him was not anything made that was made. And in him is life and this life is the light of man. And there was a man sent from God, his name was John. He came to bear witness of the light. He was not the light but he came to bear witness of the light. And then the scripture continues in the verse number 12. That as many as received him, to them he gave power to become children of God. Even to them that are called by his name, who believe in his name. And then in the verse number 14, the Bible says, And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law came through Moses, but grace came through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Is that in your Bible? Now, so the word of God is so paramount because the word of God is a person. And if we have to grow in God, any level of your spiritual work with God, the foundation is the word. That's why many times if you read the New Testament, anytime the Pharisees came to confront Jesus, he asked them, have you not read? That means he's been reading the word. And I feel in my spirit to teach you about the word of God and how to read the word of God. And why the word of God is so important. 
You must intentionally eat the word. You must intentionally soak in the word. You must intentionally read it. Nobody can automatically read the Bible. You must intentionally read the Bible. It doesn't come automatically. You must set a time that I am reading my Bible and every other major distraction should be off. The word of God is God. So we must have respect for God. And if you are engaging God, cut off every other person for the period. Switch everything off, which will distract you. Put your phone off. That's why we encourage in Protestant Church, let's use our raw Bibles. Because if you use your phone, you may get a call. And many times, even when you put it on flight mode, you are still tempted to take it off. You are tempted to check something online briefly, briefly. And that briefly never ends. It goes on. The devil knows how to trap you. So you must be intentional about blocking the interference. So turn it off. Because it's tempting. Your fingers can't rest. You've been used to it. You are addicted to going online. Unfortunately, you are suffering from that. You may be in denial, but that's the case. That's why when you don't find your phone, it feels like your world is coming to an end. As if you have lost your breath. And in our generation, we talk among us, so how did we survive without that? Because these things just started coming in 1990s. They also started having phones, mobile phones. There, there were landlines. Those were there as we were children. Hand down to us. A, 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 a telephone is there. You've seen those pictures before? The one you dial and the other one. Yeah. We don't have anything called mobile phones. We don't have them. Internet did not exist. It just started in the late 90s. That's all. So we lived. <laughs> we didn't have all those things. Now you have grown into that system. You are addicted to it. In our generation, we also feel the same way. But you realize that there is an interference to your communication with heaven. And that's why you must set a time that you are actually blocking every interference. Read your Bible and engage God alone. That's where you begin to meet God. That's where he comes to you. That's where you begin to experience God and begin to experience what pastor experiences. In our church, it shouldn't be only pastor who hears from God. And that's why I've been teaching you how to hear from God, teaching you how to position yourself in God, teaching you how to practice the gifts of the Spirit. But I'm teaching you these things because there is a discipline required to have these outcomes. And that discipline requires that you pay the price. It's just for a period. If it's one hour with the Lord and with the word of God, I will show you some few things and show you some statistics. And it's not statistics that is out there. We have practiced it and it works. And you can see how many minutes you can actually take or how many hours you can read the whole Bible from cover to cover. Like the Apostle John said, that which we have seen, that which we have tasted, that which we have handled is what we declare to you. So the Bible says that we must be doers of the word. Can we have the NIV version or the NLT? The NIV says, do not merely listen to the word and so you end up deceiving yourselves do what it says. For the word of God to benefit you, you must start doing the word. Otherwise, we would have heard a lot of messages, but you realize that it doesn't impact us. Because the nature of the word of God is that until you start practicing it, then you start experiencing it. We learn prayer by praying. You can read all the books on prayer. If you don't start praying, you will never know how to pray. You will never grow in prayer. You won't come to that level. You will not suddenly start praying 10 hours, as some of us do. We started somewhere. But you have to start praying. It is when you begin to pray, then you begin to realize that the power of God comes on you, and suddenly you are unable to stop, and you are going. It happens, and you go on and on. The power of God. But until you start practicing that, the word will not work. This is how the word of God works. The word will not work until we work the word. So, but don't just listen 
Don't just listen to the word of God. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. And that's why the challenge comes. You realize that you know so much, but you realize that you do opposite. You know you shall not commit fornication, but you find yourself committing it. Why? Because you have not put the word thou shalt not into use. You have not put the word flee into use. You have a mental knowledge, but it doesn't work. The word does not work because you don't put it to work. And so a lot of us have heard the word, but we don't look like the word. And one of the challenges is that we all have got Bibles. And we talk about it, but we don't do it. And that's why we are not growing. Until you go to the doing phase, you will not grow in God. Let me give you an analogy. You see, let's imagine together that you want to get serious about your physical health. And so you buy a book about exercise or some dieting and exercise, which is very good for you to do every day. If you don't have money for gym and you live in a house with a staircase, and just run up the stairs, go up, come down. In a very short time, you realize that your heart beats. Put on your Apple Watch and do indoor run and just go up the stairs. It may be 10 steps up. Do that. I'm sure in five minutes you'll be struggling. But you realize that you are able to do quite a lot. If your heartbeat starts hitting one between 140 and 160 per minute, you are exercising. And that can do that if you just go up that flight because you need that upward pressure on the heart. You need to be climbing up. That's why sometimes the treadmill has got what you can actually, you know, adjust to have a recline. Is it a recline or decline? Incline. Yes, incline. That's right. And it's necessary because it's for your heartbeat. The heart is a muscle. It must beat. In the same way, if you do that on the stairs, you, you, you will see that you are, you, are, you, are, you are exercising. Now, if you buy such a book and you tell a friend about it and you say, it's going to change my life from today. This book I've bought is going to change my life. Then six months later, you see your friend again and you are still in the same shape. Nothing has changed about your body size. You are just the same. And then you tell your friend, it's the greatest book I've ever read. I underline parts of it, memorize whole sections of it, and even started a study group about the book. But you have never practiced what the book taught you. That is why it didn't change you. If you begin to practice what the book taught you, you begin to see changes in your health. And it calls for discipline. So you can read the Bible, but when we move to practicing, and we are not practicing, the Bible becomes useless. And so the change that the word of God is supposed to effect in us, it never happens. Many of us have read the Bible, we have listened to preaching about forgiveness, we have not tried to forgive one person. We haven't tried it. Because the moment we try, so many reasons come up why we, do, we shouldn't for now. Let me postpone it to next week. But the word of God doesn't tell us to postpone it. It asks for immediate action. So when we delay it, we never grow to learn to forgive. Because we are not practicing the word. It is the constant practice that produces a tremendous change. And effectively, you are able to forgive so easily and you move on. Because forgiveness is so crucial. If we fail the test of forgiveness... We can never have any meaningful relationship. It's very important. I wrote in a book I'm about to release very soon on marriage. And I, I said that a great marriage is the marriage between two good forgivers. Two good forgivers. Because if, if you can't forgive, please don't think about marriage. Don't, 
Don't try it. You will soon learn it. But that is a, that is a reality on the ground. If you can't forgive, you can't marry well because you will offend each other. The people who are, if you are in love, you will offend each other because the person you have married is a human being. And indeed, you will never, see, all premarital relationships, there's a certain degree of pretense. The real person will show up when you marry. When you marry, you will see. You see things that you don't like. You see attitudes that you don't like. You see behaviors that you don't like. And they unfold. Because you, you are not living under the same roof, so you don't see it very often. Most of the time when you meet a the person, they've painted their face. Technicalists, they've got so many things on their face. The eyes are pretending they are looking, whatever. Maybe they even have a, you know, it's a borrowed colon. Oh yeah. I mean, in, there's some, someone in America, after the wedding and everything, it took the wife about a year and a half to now detect that the guy did not have the qualification he said he has. Oh yeah. It was a whole revelation. That no, no, he has never been to university. Yeah, but he said he's a medical scientist. And he married a lady who's also a banker. And they've gone on and I mean, he goes to the hospital and comes. It was like that. The lady called me and said, Bishop, Bishop, something has I've, I've, I've picked something up. I want to run it by a stool. I said, What is it? He said, Look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. I said, hey. So I called the guy. I said, speak the truth. You've been going to the hospital. When I come to the States, I, I, sometimes I call and say, you are going there. I see you wearing all the things. But what do you do? He does something different from what a doctor does. But he's not a doctor. He's not anything close to that. I won't tell you. <laughs> so that's the same thing you may meet someone and you will talk about the Bible but you have never practiced the Bible and you need to ask yourself, do you practice the same thing? Are you finding yourself doing the same thing with God's word? You mark your Bible, you underline it, but does, has the Bible marked you? When somebody sees you, can they see the mark of the Bible on you? Because once, once they see the mark, they can tell where you are coming from. Especially in, in Africa, they are, I'm sure some of you may have parents or cousins or uncles and grandparents who have got certain marks on their faces. They are tribal marks in those days. So people from Africa, they are not very stupid. They are not stupid. It's just that certain things happen to them. I don't know what really happened completely. But they are not very stupid. They are very intellectual, intelligent people. I mean, for them to, there's no computer, nothing. I mean, you have a generation of people having, how do they identify that this one is from this tribe, that one. So some of them had tribal marks to determine. We, we, those of us who grew up there, we know that when you have a certain tribe, we know you are an Ashanti. When you have a certain mark, we know that you are from the northern part of Ghana. And even in the northern part of Ghana, we know that you come from this side, that side, that side, based on the, the number of marks that are on your face. And then the others that when we see them, we know that, ah, oh, this one, before he or she was born, someone was born before him and that person died as a baby. Yeah. So these are all marks on people's faces. They mark three here, three there. 
when that is done, any child we see that, we know that is not the firstborn. We know that that one came after someone died. So they mark them to say, stay, don't go away again. So, does the word of God mark you that when we see you, we know you are a product of the word? We have got highlighters. Does the word of God highlight you when you appear? Amen. Psalm 19, verse 7 to 11. I want us to look at the word of God and what it does and why we must intentionally avail ourselves to the word. I want you to move beyond the level of just coming to church to hear pastor preach from the word. I want you to move beyond just hearing the word on audio. I want you to move to the level where you sit alone and read the word. And then when you read the word, you intentionally decide, I will practice what I have read. Amen. And I know that someone will come up with an argument about, but okay, if I read that Abraham uh, had more than one wife, can I also have more than one? And I read that Solomon had 1,000 women, 700 wives, 300 concubines. Uh, all these kings in the Bible they had multiple wives I think that I can also have three or four mine will be milder than Solomon's own oh but I see someone raped his sister in the scriptures oh I think I can do that too and I see that someone murdered someone and I think I can do the same key, when you read the Bible, you will see two things. There is one which is descriptive and there is another which is prescriptive. Amen. So descriptive describes that Solomon did this but it is not because God approved it. And the Bible is one of the genuine holy books because you see, even all the people God used, even their bad side is clearly captured in it. If it was a man-made book, it would have projected all the heroes of the Bible as holy people who never sinned. If man made it, he would project all of them as righteous, no flaw, no mistake, nothing. But the scripture, the great King David, after all his greatness and killing Goliath and all of that, the scripture, the Bible also exposed a side that he killed one of his generals so that he could sleep with the general's wife. Now that's wickedness, isn't it? David, in one day, broke at least two or three of the Ten Commandments instantly like that. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. He did. You shall not murder. He killed the man. You shall not commit adultery. He committed. Three. That's why you have to be careful of the devil. Because he can let you mess up quickly. In a short time. So that shall not commit fornication. You end up coming. Then you get pregnant. Then you go and want to cover the sin. And you cover the sin by murder. So before you realize you've broken two of the ten commandments quickly. And that's what David tried to do. He committed adultery trying to cover it. He murdered the, the husband of the woman. Now, the Bible says, so I was just sharing with you on the fact that some things are prescriptive and others are descriptive. Prescriptive means do. It is a prescription. And how do we know what is prescriptive? Because the large body of scripture will speak either in support of it or opposed to it. So, for example, again, back to it, thou shalt not commit adultery. It runs through many, many places in the scriptures. So, the fact that someone did it in scripture does not make it a prescription. It is describing that this person did this so that you become aware. 
But God's prescription is that one man to one wife. Amen. So some things happen in the scriptures and it's not a prescription for us to follow. Because even staying with one woman alone, is, she is a whole republic. How do you add another to it? Abraham tried it, there was fight in his house. An Ishmael was produced. If you try to help God, you will produce an Ishmael. And he began a fight in that house. We are still seeing it in the Middle East. Those of us who came from homes, our grandfathers had multiple wives and have several. My mother's siblings, they are 10. That's even wild. I was in school with someone. My friend, Alexa J. He has even passed away, I think, two years ago. He's the last born in their family. He's the 80th born. 80. zero. By the time we were in sixth form, when his elder brother came, his elder brother was 60 years old. When I saw him, I said, your dad is here. I said, no, that's not my dad. That's my father. <laughs> he told us when they have him party, they don't need to invite anybody because his siblings, children, is okay. I mean, you have 60 already. By the time each of them brings two, we've crossed 100. And the father was old, but he recognized all of them. He knows all of them. Eight women. Eight wives. Produced 80 children. 10 per each. Yeah, those days, that's true. So when you come, he looks at you and says, Ah, Ekwa from Takwa. Ekwa Takwa. Say, because he names the children like that because your mother comes from Takwa. Then he calls you that. Because you have different equests. Yeah, it's like in my family. My mother's side, we got different, different ones. Different land or lay, land or co, land or kai. So you have to then say land or co, Italy, land or co, this. That, because you have to distinguish between them. <laughs> we got different ones. It's a large family. So, but there is always a problem. There's always a fight over property. There's always some hatred against someone because someone's mother's children must be against some. And it, this is a crazy thing. And God saw it when he says, no. It's when we enter into it, then we see trouble. You see that Camilla herself, she's not getting it easy in the hands of Harry. Once there's a different mother, it's going to be a different matter. So we may see things in the scriptures, but not all of them are prescriptive. Some are descriptive to let us learn a lesson from it. Are you being helped today? So Psalm 19 verse 7 to 11. Um, let's take it from the, I don't know whether NLT will help or New King James. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. It is perfect. The word of God is perfect. And what does it do? It converts the soul. The word of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. I love, I, love, I love Psalm 19 because it teaches me what the word of God does. The Bible says the word of the Lord is so perfect. It's beyond any other law that can be passed by any parliament. It's so perfect and its side effect is that it converts the soul. Amen. To convert means to move from one state to the other. So it converts your soul from a state of death, a state of hopelessness, a state of foolishness into a state of wisdom. It is the word of God that does that. Your soul is the emotional part of you. The, your soul is the seat of the emotions. Remember the human being is a tripartite being. Is that correct? We've taught that many times in this church. So you don't have to worry. Now the Bible says, you know remember the God, God says that I will create man in my image after my likeness. Is that correct? Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. God came after he has spoken and everything has been made. Man was the last one he created. Then he says, let us now make man in our image after our likeness. You take note of the use of the word plural there. If he was alone, he would say, let me. He says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The way we look. Now we also understand that God is spirit, soul, and body. 
I'm sharing this for the purpose of those who are new to the word of God and to the teachings of the scriptures, the Bible. So God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and these three is still one God. Is that correct? All right. So when we check the scriptures, at least there, we begin to see God says, let us. He should have said, let me. Let us make man. Then he used the word again, another plural word, our image after our likeness and let the people we will create, let them have dominion over the earth. So how does God look like? We are told he's a spirit. But then we realize throughout the scriptures that he exists in three persons, as a father, son, and Holy Spirit. At least if we forget anything at all from the scriptures, in fact, in, by the time Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve had sinned and God came in, he made another profound statement. The father said, the man we created has become like one of us. Again, you see the word us. So in order to prevent him from living forever, let us kick them out of the garden so they don't take hold of the tree of life. On the surface of it, you'd have thought, if they have sinned against you and eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil and death is coming to them and there's a tree of life, why are you present, preventing them from touching the tree of life? God prevented them from touching the tree of life because they are already in a state of sinfulness. If they touch the tree of life, they will forever live in a state of sinfulness. So he kicked them out of the garden and put in plan, in place his plan B for the redemption of humanity. That God the son had to come, pay the price on the cross so that humanity can be delivered from eternal death. You have all the details comprehensively laid out in my book, Doing the Master's Will. Amen. But at least, if you have any doubt at all, about the fact that God exists in three persons as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you can't actually deduce it from the Genesis 3 account where he used the word us, that the man has become one of us. At least, there are many places in the Old Testament. But let me take you straight to Matthew chapter 3, Luke chapter 3. At least, we see something so unique. Right at the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, Something unique happened. The Bible says that now we have God the Son. He has been born. He's 30 years old. Jesus Christ decides to offer himself voluntarily to be baptized. And he walked to the Jordan and John the Baptist was there. And the Bible says Jesus, having been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. So here we have the body of water. Let's assume it's the stage here. Jesus had been baptized by immersion, completely dipped inside the water and brought out. And then the Bible says that then the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, descended like a dove upon Jesus. So now we have got Jesus, who is God the Son, standing right there physically in the water. The Holy Ghost descends like a dove upon him. And then the Bible says, and a voice spoke from heaven. A voice spoke from heaven. And the Bible says, a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. My beloved son. So that means the person speaking from above is the father, isn't it? And we have the Holy Spirit right there in the form of a dove and we have Jesus Christ standing in the water. You have the three personalities right there captured clearly in the scriptures. Now, why am I boring you with all of this? For you to see that the word of God is so true and the word of God is so genuine. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And so you realize that the human being is also in a three states like that. You have your body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. With your body, you contact the physical world. The soul is attached to the spirit. The soul is not the same as the spirit. The soul, let's call it the, the mind and the spirit. The soul is the seat of your emotions. And as, as a human being, you have got a mind, isn't it? It's inside the brain. The brain is not the mind. 
isn't it? The mind is inside the brain. And that's exactly how the soul is. That's what the Bible says at the point of death, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 12. It says, then shall the spirit return to God who gave it. Because in the beginning, God breathed into man the breath of life. And man became a living being. So, you have a soul. The soul is a seat of your emotions. We express it. We express, we cry. We mourn, we grieve. We do all those things. And it's attached. It is by which we recognize things. We are able to identify things and recognize things. And when the spirit man leaves the body, he will still recognize things. That's why Jesus gave the example in Luke chapter 16 about the rich man who died and went to um, um, the poor man died and went to Abraham's bosom. Rich man died and went to hell. And says in hell he lifted his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off. He also saw, he could tell that his brothers are still on the earth. They haven't died. So we can recognize people. Now, the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Why did I take time trying to explain the soul? Because that is the part of you which expresses passion. If the state of your soul is not solid, you can easily sin. Because you see, your spirit man must be so strong so as to be able to overrule the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh are communicated first to the soul which is the emotional part of you. Remember God said, the reason why I'm creating man is that, that they will have dominion over the earth. Your body is earth. Have you realized? Do you know that? According to the word of God, God created us out of the ground. So your, this is your skin, which you like so much and you paint it and you do all kinds of is soil. Clay. Your eyes are clay. As you see them, you must look at them. Me, I'm just look at these. I'm like, ah, this is wonderful. God. Clay is talking. Clay is dancing. That's what the Bible says. Just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. As soon as your spirit checks out of this body, it goes back to the ground. If you visit the cemetery after so many years, you realize that it has converted back to soil. The word of God cannot be broken. So this flesh has got some desires. Originally, your spirit man has power that whatever the flesh desires and the soul also tries to admire, the spirit overrules it. But ever since the fall of man, the flesh became dominant. The spirit man was suppressed. The soul and the flesh were dominating. Until Jesus came, died on the cross, and therefore, when we go to him, there is a revival of our human spirit that died in Genesis, that disengaged from God in Genesis. And that's what we call born again. So when you are born again, your spirit man becomes a baby again. Your flesh has too much of the worldly experience. You must eat enough of the word of God because your body can only grow when you eat your McDonald's and your Kenke and Banku and Eba and Fufu and all those other wonderful dishes that you like when you go to Nando's and you just order and you eat and your soul is happy with you. By your spirit man, for it to grow, it only feeds on the word of God. So after you are born again, that's why people can be born again today. By 6 p.m., they are committing fornication. They might be in church today. Oh, Lord, and tears I have come to know the Lord. Ha, ha. By 6 p.m., they are fornicated. Why? Because the flesh has more appetite experience than the human spirit that has now been regenerated in Christ. And that is why you must intentionally feed your spirit man until it develops all the muscles so that when the flesh desires anything, the spirit man can overrule it. He said, we're not having it this time until we are married. That's how self-control develops. Because otherwise, 
we are just fooling ourselves, as the scripture says. That's why you must read the word of God. Because anytime you read the word, spirit and life is entering you. Psalm 119. The entrance of thy word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. So spiritually, light is entering into you. Your spirit man is being fed daily by the word. And that leads us to overcome temptations when we see them. That informs us ahead of time to escape before it happens. That's why you cannot decide to toy with it and say, okay, I'm testing it and then I will run away. You cannot run away. You'll be arrested. The breast will arrest you. That's why you commit fornication at 11 o'clock and then say, oh, let's stop. Let's not do it again. 11.45, you have done it again. Say, no, let's stop. No, no, it's not happening. It's not happening. 12.15, you have done every 15 minutes is happening. Why is it that you promise with your mouth but you can't act? Because you still don't have the spiritual dominance. And you must apply it. The word of God says flee. He didn't say play around with it and see. That's what I'm talking about. Has the word marked you? Because when you apply the word, the Bible says flee. He didn't say toy, play around it. No. God's word knows. God, the one who designed it, he knows. That you have to flee. You have to avoid. It's an instruction of the word of God. But the moment we hear the word and we don't apply the word, we will fall into sin. Are you here? Yeah. So the testimony of the Lord, it says the word of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. This Psalm 19 gives us different descriptions of the word of God. Different descriptions of the name given to the word of God. Number one, it is called the law of the Lord. And it's perfect. It converts the soul. When you expose yourself to the word of God and you decide to practice it, you realize that all that quick temper you have, and you say you have got anger problems, it will disappear. Because the word of God will tell you, don't hit back. The Holy Spirit will speak the word, will also say, Vengeance is mine. I will repay. You put your hand in your pocket. You want to strike, you put it in your pocket. Yeah. So the way my body is doing me, I think I need to embrace some guy, some girl. Run away, you won't die. Tell yourself, I'm not honoring this appointment today. I'm staying home. I've locked the door. I've put my phone off. Stay in the room. You won't die. So the way my body, let the body do whatever it's doing. It will be over. Apply the word. Expose yourself to the word. You gradually overrule it. and you Because you see, when you don't practice it at this age, when you marry, it will come and bite you. If marriage is a cure for sexual immorality, the word adultery should never exist. So if we don't have the discipline before that, after we marry, we will still not have the discipline. And we we'll embarrass ourselves all over the place. Amen. As you pastor, you see a lot of things. One of my greatest embarrassments was to pastor someone and she gets pregnant. And you said, so who is responsible? We went to George. He said, it's not, uh, it was not uh, my girl. Now you call four, four guys. And every family house is on fire. Every mother is out for defense. It's not my son. It's not my son. This one to say, what, what do we do? It happens among unbelievers and it happened in church too. And as a pastor, you get, you stand and say, now I need word of knowledge. I say, how does George come into the picture? Are you going out with him? No. I mean, how do you sleep with someone who's wrong? If you are not even, if you are going out, we won't even understand, but we can perceive that temptation can happen. I, I won't accept it, but I can understand a little bit that temptation can happen. But if you are not in a relationship with anybody and you sleep with somebody, come on. You need some whips and canes. You need discipline. Ah! And then 
we have four of that. Because naturally we would have gone to the person that you are going out with, isn't it? But then, the, the, and that, that, was the, that was the confusion. Because whilst we know she was going out with someone, which is officially lodged with the church, because if you are going out, we must do. Stop hiding in your going out. Because when trouble comes, we will not be there to defend you. That was the first question. Is it that one? He said, no, that's what confused me. I thought is that then we know what we are going to do. But then, it's not him. And you are calling for. Therefore, you are going to. It's not even him. He is the fifth outlier. He's standing there. So I asked her, so how are you calling the four and not him? He said, he has never had sex with me. I said, hey, righteous brother. <laughs> Congratulations. You have done very well. Two years, you didn't touch her. You have followed me. You have followed me. You have testimony on your wedding day. So how about those other four? No definition of relationship. You can sleep with such a person. You need bleach, bleach. Bleach to bleach you. You need discipline. Otherwise, it means that even if you are married, you can do such a thing. And you can create problems. There are many homes. Some of the children, the father of the house is not their father. Okay, let's go. Please, let's leave this. <laughs> DNA will show it. DNA. One day I will tell you things. One day I will tell you a lot of things. One day, one day, one day I will tell you. Today is to hear the word of God <laughs> and practice it. Are you excited in church? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It's converting you from all this, your passionate, emotional, all this nonsense. Bringing it, taming it, and helping you to direct it properly. In the name of Jesus. Self-control is part of the soul. You are very emotional about things. It's good. There's a positive side. But the way you react quickly, you get upset so easily. You are destroying things. So self-control. Any little thing is over. Every time is over. You can't marry. This thing called marriage is a different thing. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So the word of God can make you wise. Paul wrote and said, the word of God which is able to make you wise. From your childhood, the word of God is able to make you wise. And if there's anything you need in life, you need wisdom. Have you realized that Every second of your life, you are making decisions. Life is full of decision making. As I'm talking, you are deciding whether to continue to listen to me. Or some guy has texted you. <laughs> you are making a decision whether to look on your phone or to carry on watching me. Every second of the way, life is full of decision making. And if you will make very good decisions, it comes from wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to perceive danger and take the right steps to overcome and overtake it. It's the correct application of knowledge. There's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is the acquisition of facts. Wisdom is the application of the knowledge, the correct application of the knowledge. So if you will make any wise choices, it will come from wisdom. And the Bible says the word of God teaches us those things. It's the word of God. So if you're exposing yourself to the word, the Bible says it will make you wise. Number three, verse eight. The statutes of the Lord is now called the statutes. The law, the testimony, the statutes. 
time will fail me to break every one of them down. Another time. Another time I'll tell you what the law probably is. Why have they used statutes and why have they used testimony? The commandment of the Lord. No, okay. The statutes of the Lord are right. It rejoices the heart. I love it. You know, sometimes you come to church very depressed. And by the time the message is over, pastor has finished preaching, you just feel like there's some, something lifted off you. You feel excited again. The mystery of the word. How did one man standing there and preaching to over 200 people who have different needs and at the end of the service, everybody can say, Pastor, today you spoke to me. Isn't it a mystery? It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Unless the person is not anointed. If he's not anointed, it's just a lecturer. The statutes of the Lord are right. It rejoices the heart. It brings elevation again. It brings joy to your heart. It brings hope again. People come to church feeling so depressed, feeling so hopeless, and by the time the word of God comes, you feel elevated. You feel like something has been lifted off your bed and lifted off. You don't have the answer yet, but there's joy in your spirit. In the same way, when you experience the word of God alone, you begin to see these things. When things are looking bad, but you are rejoicing in your spirit. That's when you go to work and you are singing, and your friends come and say, your work colleagues say, you, today, you, you, you look and sound very happy. You are happy today. Joy overflows with my heart. All right. Number four. Verse 8b. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. It's enlightening the eyes. You have Billy Oyimbe. This is Ghana. Bag Billy Oyimbe. It will open your eyes. And then be with you. That's how the, the three people will say it. The word of the Lord, it enlightens your eyes. It brings insight. You see what others don't see. The word of the Lord shows you things that others can't see. And it's a great advantage. And that's why daily you must read the word. And that's why Satan fights your ability to read the word. You can read every other material. So long as you open Bible, you start yawning. Suddenly you start feeling tired, uninterested, all that. At the same time, any other thing, you will quickly consume it. The word of the Lord opens your eyes. It gives you wisdom. It enlightens your eyes. The Bible says, as young as you are, you are able to be wise by the word of God. See, so many years ago, when I was very young, I had a stepmother. And she, because of properties and stuff like that, she wanted to get rid of a certain group of us. She has only one child, but my God. And she's the last one. One day she put a lie on me at the age of 10. Strangely, dad believed her and I was asked to leave the house. I was trying to explain my side. Dad was not ready to listen. So I was asked to go out of the house. Now it's 10 p.m. This happened around 5 p.m. It's 10 p.m. I'm trying to get back to the house. He said, no. You are not coming. That is such a very influential personality within the community and the city we live in. He's a very, very powerful man. So everybody was afraid to host you in their house because they can't tell what he will do. So I have to sleep at the school park. Second day, same thing. Third day, fourth, fifth day. And I have to find some means to travel to another city. To my mother. They were surprised to see me alone. At 10 years old. Having traveled a journey of about one hour. On your own. 
Well, long story short, family elders decided to go and find out what's happening. Dad strangely said, well, he wants to maintain his marriage, so I should go. I said, but what did the boy do? He said, I can't explain. I don't know. But it looks like my wife doesn't want his presence here as well. Hey, Charlie, how would you do? Anyway, you carried on with your life. Mom had to step in, make sure that, okay, you carry on with your education, continue from this place, do your exams, get to secondary school. Now, if you were in my shoes, you would not like this woman, isn't it? Yeah. Because, of course, my other siblings, she has also been instrumental in making sure they are all kicked out so that she can have the property for herself and anything that she's dreaming of. Anyway, long story short, daddy... Unfortunately, passed away at a very young age of 56. I was in secondary school. I was in sixth form. And then, I think before I went to secondary school, I have to, before I went to university, I had to do what they call national service. So I was at the national service praying one day, and I fell asleep. When I slept, I realized that before dad died, he came to make peace with us so I could go back to the house. Stepmom was still one part. But I, dad asked me to stay in his master bedroom. Stepmom doesn't like that idea. Then dad passed. Whilst I was in national service, just before university, I had this dream that the room, the master bedroom has been broken and the things in there have been taken away. So I followed on to the house. I traveled three hours and came. And when I came, exactly what I saw has happened. I asked people in the house. Everybody said they don't know who broke into it. So I, re I reported to the police. The police came to do their investigation and they arrested my stepmother. And, um, you know, you could see the jubilation from the other side. That is my mother's family and they have to jail this woman. You know, the date was fixed. Our lawyers have told us she will, she will be jailed. And on the morning, when and I've seen my aunties and they have all come and said, make sure nobody asks you. Don't change your mind. Make sure she's jailed. And when I was asked, the wisdom of the Lord, as a teenager, I think I was 19 or so, I just thought that dad had a child with her. One day when I become a great person, this man stepmother would one day say I jailed the mother. So to the annoyance of all my aunties from my mother's side, right at the court when the question, because you have to agree that they proceed. I said no. I could see the face of my aunties, my siblings, everybody was like, this is revenge time. I said, I leave me the keys to the room. So they let her go. You see, so many years later, this woman dies. Dad had died. He's my little brother. He's nothing. He was seven when daddy died. I'll provide for him. Today he's finished university. He's married. I sponsored the marriage. He's in the United States. He's a pastor. He's doing great. Last of July, he came down to visit me and spent one week with me. And I told my wife, what if I've jailed the mother? What would have happened? Do you think we'd have had this relationship? Whenever I get to the States for any of my ministry things, he will move heaven and earth and show equipment, everything. How did it happen that as young as I was, I had the wisdom and the foresight to see ahead and not let my emotions get in for revenge? Are you 
you seeing what I'm trying to tell you? That's why the Bible says the word of the Lord converts us and the word of the Lord gives us wisdom. Today, I cherish my relationship with God. But it would have been a different story if the record showed wisdom came from my exposure to the word of God. Are you here today? May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. All right then. Number, verse 9. That will be number 6. Is that 6? Converting the soul. Testimony is sure. Making wise the simple. Statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. Commandment of the Lord is pure. Enlightening the eyes. Number four. So number 5. Verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The word of the Lord is also the source of the fear of the Lord. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I pray that you have a strong appetite for the word. Please, with all your spirit, soul, and body, fight off any distraction. You must do it deliberately. Whenever I must read the Bible, I put on a video. I get busy as I grow in the ministry and my responsibilities increase. Then how do I read the Bible? It's very dangerous at my level. It's very, very dangerous. It is very, very risky not to read the Bible. The temptation is very, very high. Because there's nobody in the church who can give me a call and ask me, have you read the Bible? I can do that to you. I can do that to my pastors. But none of them can do that to me. So it's very risky as you rise up. And the temptation is very high at that place. If I haven't prayed, who is going to ask me what I've prayed? The danger even is that everybody assumes I have prayed. Isn't it? When you wake up, does it ever cross your mind? I, I don't think Bishop has prayed today. Does he? Okay. You, do you understand? You, my reputation, everything makes you, and that can be dangerous. It means that I can flow through the day without praying. No. But I have an accountability with God. So I have to ensure I do my prayer. It is my work. I have to pray every day. I must read the Bible every day. And every time I read it, I receive new revelation, new insight, new understanding. But the temptation not to read can be very high. You can actually be busy with the work of the Lord without having a relationship with the Lord. And Satan can trap you very easily. That's why the Bible says at the time kings used to go for war, David took a panoramic view when he saw a pornographic scene. He should have been busy with the work of the Lord. He wouldn't have seen the temptation. Am I blessing you this afternoon? Because God wants you to come up. All right, let me finish this. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The word of the Lord is also called the judgments of the Lord. It is true and it is righteous altogether. And when you soak it into your spirit, truth and righteousness shall become your way of life. Verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold. When you are awake spiritually, you desire the word of God more than gold. What is your appetite in the morning? What is taking your attention first? What is coming before the word first? Insta, straight, first thing when you wake up. When you wake up first, the word, word of God, word of God should be first. Switch everything off, intentionally switch it off. If you don't, you will struggle. You will struggle. And you have to be honest with yourself. I'm very honest with myself. Because as I grow, I get involved in all these technology things. So you can occupy me. I have every good reason to say, okay, let it be there. I'll receive an email. I've got things to respond to, especially when it gets to November, December. I'm very, very busy. Very, very busy. And then around this time, we are fasting. And we are fasting. Generally, nobody's supposed to disturb me. I'm not supposed to have any appointment. Pastors don't carry certain things to me. They have to leave me alone to 
to seeking God. I desire my life reports from branches, things done, back and forth, review meetings, so many things, performance appraisal meetings, so many things. So you have got enough reason. You are dealing with legal issues, 30 station road. You are dealing with so many things, branches, buildings, they go and hide something, something happens, any problems, good news, bad news, all those things happening. Bereavements. Your, your, your counsel is being sought every time. In addition to all of this, family stuff. Wider family. And you have to call them, says the chair this meeting. There's a bereavement. They want you to chair. I said, but the head of family, say the head of family, you know, there are some people who have got issues with him. You are the only unifier. When you speak, everybody can come. Head of family can then hide behind you and get it. Even tonight after prayer, I've got family meeting to head. Chair meeting. Now, you have got all these things going on, and so you have got enough reason to say, oh, I need to keep my phone on. I need to keep this one on. I, I may not meet. Listen, who is dying? Whoever will die, let them die. Let the phone go off. Because they never die. They will not die. What kind of trouble will happen that my phone will have to be off? I'm not emergency services. So at the time I must read the word, I have disciplined myself, I will put the phone off. I put it off. I put something off, I put it I remember somewhere in the week, I was suggesting try to call me. And she called me at the wrong time. She knows the time I pray, but this time she called me at the time she thinks I wasn't praying, but the prayer has extended by an hour or two. So I think she got so frustrated, she called me, call me, call me, call me. And then she's, she called grandma's number and told her, go and check the room, is he alive or what? Grandma also came to me and realized that no, the prayer the she just went away. <laughs> when I finished, she text, I put my phone on. She texted I would try. I said, I was praying. I said, what was it? She said, oh, I was just checking. I said, hey, it has to be you are checking up on me. But I mean, there's nobody dying, isn't it? Yes. Otherwise, the devil would have robbed me of prayer time and wet time. Listen, schedule your time well. Get up and read your Bible. Listen, when we all pray at 5 a.m., it's not part of your prayer. Your prayer for the day must be you alone with Jehovah. Because even at 5 a.m., you are used as an excuse. You even join us at 10 minutes to the end. So you have not even prayed an hour. Okay, let's finish this way. They are more to be desired than gold, yet more than fine gold. The Bible says they are sweeter also than honey and honeycomb. The word of God is sweet. What have you been desiring? You have appetite for everything except the word. Today I pray in the name of Jesus. May you lose appetite for foolishness and have appetite for the word. In Jesus' name. Your mind is on certain things. Let the mind be on the word. Sweeter than honey. Let that be your appetite. If you are there, you are, you are salivating because of the word. Verse 11. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. It's through the word of God that we receive warnings. And in keeping them, there is great reward. Hallelujah. Keeping the word of God. You see, after we have read all of that, we are told that we must keep them. That means we must intentionally practice them. It must be part of us. And they are with us. In Jesus' name. Quick scriptures. Quick, 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 quick. Let's do this one. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. A wise man that built their house on the rock. Jesus said, if you hear my words and you do them, then you are wise. So the doing is important. But how can there be a doing when they have not been reading? If you are not aware of something, how can you say that you are practicing it? And like I said in the morning, how can you say you believe the Bible and you have not read it cover to cover? So what do you believe? If you don't know what is there, what do you say you believe? God doesn't have grandchildren. He has children. Be a child. With your father. Hebrews 4 12. For the word of God is living and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword. It piercings even to the division of soul and spirit. The word of God, it will separate soul from spirit. You know that this is soulish behavior, soulish prayers you are praying. People pray soulish prayers. In a church in America, I was invited. As soon as I got to the airport, the pastor's wife beat me, said, as pastor speaking to you, he said, Lord, he said, we want you to do something. After you finish the revival tonight, tomorrow, I want you to meet all the women. That's how we give you. I said, what is it? He said, some people in the church, some women in the church, they have gathered and they pray every Thursday evening that the pastor's wife will die. So that one of them will marry the pastor. Seke, seke, seke in capital letters. Seke in the Ghana language means madness. So I went to, I went to meet them on the Saturday morning after the Friday night revival. I met all the women. I gave it to them. I blasted them. I told them which Holy Spirit inspired these prayer meetings. Won't you look for your own? somebody's wife to die so that you will take the place. I say, what is the guarantee that the pastor will even marry you? That's a soulish prayer. The Bible says the word of God divides soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of man, of the heart. Hebrews 4, 12. Never forget the scriptures. So in order to receive the blessing of the Lord, we must respond to the word of God and let the word change us. Hallelujah. And sometimes even when you have in practice intentionally responding to God's word, it might be hard to know where to start from. Pastor, where do I start from? Now I want to read this word. Where do I start from? At least we have a start, a head start in the church. We are reading four chapters every day. We get the information every month, isn't it? Every month we've got the scriptures laid out so that when we follow all, by December 31st, we'd have all read the Bible cover to cover. Four chapters should not be too long to read. Some of you read long Instagram messages and Snapchats and text messages and WhatsApp. If you print all of them, they will be more than four chapters in a day. Deliberately do that. And when you're going to read the scriptures, ask yourself a few questions. If you're going to read a passage for you to be able to get into the word. Anything you read in the Bible, maybe you can start with little until we're having four chapters. Our pastors are supposed to be reading 15 chapters a day. As for me, we all know. I've told you many times. How, how many chapters do I read in a day? 32. I've, I've read 11 chapters already this morning. Before I came to church. And I've preached. And when I go back later in the night, I'll continue. Do you know? Even the three you are struggling with. When are you ever going to get to 15? It is possible. You start little by little. And you pray. And Lord help me. Holy Spirit draw me. And as you do so, you see that you will gradually be doing it. I didn't start today. I started some years ago. When God first told me to pray 10 hours during vacation from 6 p.m. I was wondering where am I going to get the time to pray 10 hours? There's football going on there. There's different things I'm involved in. But gradually, I found the time to pray. It may not be 10 hours continuously. Of course, certain days, I did 10 hours, like my Saturdays. But every day, you split it. So if I pray six hours every day, I may have prayed two hours. After the one hour before, we all do morning devotion, prayer hour. So by the time you have joined at five, I've warmed up already by an hour. And then when you finish, you carry on another one hour. And then you split 12 midday, 3 p.m. I'm giving you my times now. And that's why certain times, if you call me in the name of Jesus, you would never get me anywhere. <laughs> Don't call me at 12 midday unless I put a particular appointment there. 12 midday, I'll be there. have to intentionally schedule to meet God. And when you do so, you will find him coming to meet you. I'm sharing some secrets. You should start trying them. You'll see. Anyway, 
you have to ask yourself, does this show me a sin I need to confess or an attitude to change? As you read your Bible, for you to engage, because some of you say, it's boring, I don't know, it's, I don't know, yeah, engage it. Ask yourself questions. What you have just read, is it showing me a sin that I need to confess? This, ah, this sin, oh, so maybe this thing is a sin. I didn't know that it's a sin. Okay. Can I, am I supposed to confess this? Or is there an attitude I need to change? The next question is, does God give me a command to obey or an example to follow? So as you're reading the scriptures, you find yourself, is there a command that I have to obey? And is there an example that I need to follow? So when you're reading your Bible, these are the questions you start asking yourself. Is there a prayer in this passage of scripture that I can pray for myself or for other people? So you may have read a scripture and you realize that I can pray this for a friend. I have an auntie, I have a cousin, I have a brother, he's married, they are not having children. Ah, but I just read that Hannah prayed, God help her. Can I pray the same thing for my cousin? Can I say the same thing for my brother? These are the way you ask these questions. So you start with these questions and as you put them into practice, you will soon find that you are not the same person. Something begins to change about you. We should all be living Bible. Amen. And let me now drop one or two things in your head. It takes 75 hours to read the entire Bible nonstop. Madeline, you are surprised. It takes 75 hours. I told you, I won't tell you anything that we haven't asked. And you can check with other serious-minded men of God or theologians. 75 hours to read the entire Bible non-stop if you have the time. How many days is 75 hours? Non-stop. I mean, you're not breaking to do anything non-stop. The pace is key. Now, spreading these 75 hours over the year, it will take you 0.2 hours per day. That is 12 minutes per day of reading the Bible to complete it in one year. Did you understand what I just said? Do I have to repeat it? So I'm saying that if you spread these 75 hours over a year, that means that it's going to take you 0.2 hours a day. Which approximately is about 12 minutes a day of reading the Bible. If you commit 12 minutes to reading the Bible every day, you will still finish it. Amen. Now, there are 773,746 words in the Bible. 773,746 words in the Bible. That means that speed is required if you have to read and meet this pace. And so the speed required is 172 words per minute of effective reading. Ekwa, are you following? You missed the number, eh? So I said, out of this 773, 746 words in the Bible. Speed that is required to be able to meet it is 172 words per minute. You read 172 words per minute of effective reading time. Because you see, there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. 1,189 chapters in the Bible. And the average number of words per chapter is 651. Bishop, you are a very interesting teacher. Of course, if you are an anointed teacher of the word, that's how you also, when you are reading your Bible, you see these things. <laughs> Erwin, are you lost somewhere with the numbers? <laughs> okay, I will, I will just mention it. I will pick this from my notes and make sure you all get it. Amen. Because the way Erwin, Erwin is struggling, I think he wants to be like me, but you, you really have to, you have to remember the numbers. Jermaine, are you coming up? You're almost there. Okay. 
So 1,189 chapters in the Bible, the average number of words per chapter is 651. Therefore, it takes an average of 3.8 minutes to read a chapter of the Bible. Read, not study, read. So the read, to read the whole Bible in a year, at a rate of 12 minutes per day, one will have to read a minimum of three chapters a day. You have to read a minimum of three chapters a day, and that is the reason why I've given you four chapters a day. Amen. And sometimes to avoid boredom, you pick a mixture of chapters from the six different parts of the Bible. But this time I've just decided that you follow sequentially so that one story makes sense to the other. But when we have perfected it for some time, we can mix and match. Amen. So you, you will pick a mixture of chapters from six different parts of the Bible. You know that the Bible is split into six different parts. The Pentateuch which is the five, first five books of the Bible. Then you have the historical books, Judges all the way to um, Job. Then you've got the lyrical wisdom, the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Then you've got the prophets. And then you have the gospel and the book of Acts and then the epistles and the book of Revelation. Amen. All right, oh, let me end here. Let me end here. I've loaded you so much information. It's all about the word. Tell somebody it's about the word. In Jesus' name. Have you been blessed? Put your hands together for the Lord Jesus Christ. Please give me Romans 13, 14. And I want you to pray from there. If there's going to be any change, may we not be people who just say we are Christians. May the word of God be seen in us. As we highlight our Bibles, may the Bible mark us and highlight us. When we appear, they should see us as children of the word. Not that we parrot the word, but we act the word. The Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ like a garment. You have to put him on. And then make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So don't make provision to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Don't make provision for it. You know, if I know I'm going to travel, I make provision. What I will pack, etc., etc. The Bible says that the only way you will not be able to make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust is that you must put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put him on. When you put on the word, when you begin to practice the word, you have put on the Lord Jesus Christ as a garment. And so you will not make provision for the flesh. You know that if you visit that guy, sex will happen. Why are you going? You are making provision for the sex to happen. If you, you know that if you go to that place, you end up drinking alcohol. Why are you making provision? Are you here today? The Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its last thereof. Listen, God is calling for righteousness. It changes the game. In Jesus' name, you need to live a holy life. And holiness doesn't happen automatically. It happens because there's much of the word in you. In Jesus' name. And when you have more of the word, it produces the fear of God in us. in the chapter 2 of that book on marriage that marriage has never stopped a man from, from sleeping around. It is the fear of God in him that stops him. Amen. It's the fear of God in your spouse. It's the fear of God in you that will stop you. As for the flesh, it will, it will always be calling for things. The flesh will make you feel horny. But, you have to say, hey, flesh, hold on, hold on. I'm not making provision for you. <laughs> you have no budget at all. Not at this time. Keep yourself. 
maintain your dignity. It will speak for you in some years to come. Please lift your voice and begin to talk to God and say, Lord, let your word transform me. Draw me into the word. I want to be an addict of the word of God in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. What a proton service. What a teaching. I've done a lot of talking, but it's worth it in Jesus' name. This message is for someone. Apply the word. Rebel against the flesh. Rebel against the flesh. Rebel against the excuses of your body when it comes to the reading of the word of God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray. Holy Spirit, arrest my heart. Convict me. I want to be a Christian after your heart. I want to be a believer. How can we say we are believers? And we haven't read the scriptures to believe in. What have you believed? Spirit of God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May from tonight as you start reading the Bible, may the Holy Spirit create an unusual appetite for the word in you. Lord, I stand as your servant. Your word says, as the priest, so will the congregation be. I appeal to your very throne based on your covenant over my life and especially the special grace you have given me to read copious volumes of the word of God in a day. I request an impartation of this grace upon everybody in this room right now. Take it. Receive this grace to be able to read the Bible. To be able to read the Bible in the name of Jesus. Receive this impartation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.